Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. This is a tape designed to introduce you to the second clinic session in Oral Health 504. We are going to cover some of the problems concerned with educating and motivating patients and some of the problems concerned with polishing teeth. Now there are a certain number of instruments that you will need for today's clinic session and these include the following. You will need a mouth mirror, periodontal probes, explorers, dental floss, your own toothbrush, uh, some prophylaxis cups, the rubber cups. Let me see if I can show you here. You have both white and uh, black rubber cups. The black ones are just slightly softer than the white ones. You will also have prophylaxis brushes, which you will receive in the kits. In addition to uh, the instruments and supplies that we've already discussed, you will also need uh, your electrotorque motor and your handpiece and your prophylaxis contraangle. The, uh, you will need a patient napkin and bib, bib clips that go along with it, some uh, two by two gauze squares, Disclosing solution, prophylaxis paste, the uh, plaque scoring card if you've not already completed your plaque scores from last week, and uh, also two toothbrushes, the Multituff brush and the Bass brush. First, what I'd like to demonstrate to you now is some of the commonly made mistakes of, that patients make in trying to learn to floss their teeth. First of all, let me show you the amount of dental floss that should be used. Many people tend to take out a very small piece of floss. Take out a larger piece. Take out at least this much floss. We say around 18 to 24 inches or so. And then be sure that you take and you wrap it up on both fingers here until you get it firmly attached to both fingers with about this much floss in between the two index fingers. Now let me move to the mouth here and show you some of the common mistakes that are made. Many people when you're trying to teach them to floss will take and just snap the floss down between the teeth. Do not let this happen. If they'll get in the habit of sliding the floss back and forth you'll find that it's possible to slide the floss in between the teeth with very little effort. And also, even though people slide it in between the teeth, they tend to snap it back out again. Don't let them do that, but slide it back out again. Now, once the floss has been slid between the teeth to clear the contact area, then it's important to have the fingers as close to the tooth that you're working on as possible. By having the fingers close, you have much more control over the floss. On the other hand, if the fingers are way out here like this, you have less control. When the fingers are close to the teeth, you should be able to take the floss and move it around the one tooth here, both on the buccal and the lingual. Move it up over the papilla. And move it back on this side. And again, moving it in a vertical manner, polishing the side of the tooth. The idea is not just to clean the interproximal area, but to clean the surfaces of each one of those teeth. Some uh, people, when learning to use floss, also tend to push the floss deep into the sulcus. Can you tip your head down just a little bit, Bob? Okay. And the patient should be instructed to put the floss in the sulcus just until he meets general resistance. And if you look closely, you can see the tissue blanches out just a little bit. When uh, flossing, uh, one should also remember to use the floss around the distal edge of uh, upper and lower second molars. Uh, it's also important to use the floss in areas of uh, 
that border edentulous spaces. These uh, edentulous spaces need to be cleaned just like any other areas in the mouth. Uh, again, up here where we have a diastema between the teeth, this is an excellent area for floss to come in between the teeth again. One on this side here, and then on this side here. Final summary remark about floss, there's always some controversy again about whether to use waxed or unwaxed floss. I think you'll find that using unwaxed floss uh, will work in mouths that have smooth restorations and the absence of any roughness or overhanging margins on the restorations. On the other hand, if there is a fair amount of roughness, uh, which uh, you're not equipped to remove at this stage in your training, then I would suggest wax floss because it tends to tear or shred less. Now, the next areas that we'd like to discuss would be those that concern toothbrushing technique. But, uh, the two brushes that uh, you have will be both the bass brush and the multi-tuft design brushes. Now, this is the bass brush here. This is the multi-tuft brush. Most of the things that we're going to talk about in connection with toothbrushing techniques do not apply specifically to one technique or the other, but are generalized mistakes that are made. A frequently missed area is the buckle of the maxillary posterior teeth. In order to gain access to this area, a patient should be instructed to open slightly and swing his jaw to the right or to the left, as is indicated. This enables you to take the brush and effectively angle the bristles so the plaque may be cleaned off of those surfaces. Another problem area can be the lower linguals. In order to get these areas, the patient should be instructed to open wide and place the brush against the lower teeth so that the bristles contact the gingival crevice. A common mistake is for patients to think that they have angled the brush so that the bristles have reached the junction between the tooth and the gum. However, many times the brush is angled so that the bristles only move back and forth above that line. It's necessary to instruct the patient to tilt the brush or angle the brush toward the gingival sulcus so that the bristles, in effect, enter the gingival sulcus and clean at the junction of the tooth and the gum, or the denogingival junction. Another uh, frequently uh, missed area or difficult area for patients to manipulate the toothbrush in is the curvature around the lingual of the upper and lower front teeth. It's uh, very difficult to take the brush and place it so that the bristles will cover all of those lower front teeth. And it's suggested that instead of trying to manipulate the brush in this manner, that the brush be turned around and placed like this so that the bristles will enter the gingival sulcus. Another frequently uh, made mistake in this same area is for the, the patient to pull out on the brush. When the uh, brush is pulled out, the bristles tend to fan away from the teeth on the lingual. It's necessary to instruct them to press in the vertical or the long axis of the toothbrush bristles in a manner such as this. Many times um, it's difficult uh, when manipulating the toothbrush and there is an alteration in gingival contour which results in the denogingival junction being at pre uh, different levels uh, between different teeth such as between the lateral and the cuspid and this premolar. If one are using a uh, technique of toothbrushing which tends to work the bristles at the denogingival junction, many times that area at the denogingival junction will be missed. It's necessary to instruct the patient to manipulate the brush so that he enters the denogingival junction on those isolated teeth. There are certain problems which are unique to both right and left-handed brushers. Right-handed brushers tend to miss the area between the cuspid central and lateral on the right side. They brush the maxillary right quadrant and then are anxious to switch over to the maxillary left quadrant and therefore miss these three teeth. And left-handers uh, tend to do likewise. Now let me demonstrate uh, something to you about polishing of the teeth. Polishing of the teeth, of course, is done to remove plaque 
and stain and to smooth the surfaces of the teeth. And the polishing is done with the aid of a polishing contraangle. Polishing uh, contraangle fits on the end of your straight hand piece. And the polishing is done with the help of a rubber cup. Now the rubber cup is inserted in the end of the polishing handpiece by turning the rheostat in a counterclockwise direction and merely just taking the cup and placing it like this. It's um, helpful to rotate the cup in a counterclockwise direction also when putting prophylaxis paste in the cup, doing it like this. It avoids splattering and a lot of scraping down in here to get the prophylaxis paste out. The cup should be rotated at a moderate amount of speed, one of the first uh, one or two settings on the rheostat. Speed does, sounds about like this. It's important not to rotate the cup too fast because you produce a fair amount of heat on the surface of the tooth and in addition to that will splatter some prophylaxis paste. Once you've loaded the cup with prophylaxis paste, Position it on the tooth before turning it on. This also avoids uh, splattering of prophylaxis paste. Once you position it on the tooth, rotate the prophylaxis cup, pressing it with fairly firm pressure against the surface of the tooth so as to fan it out slightly. In fanning it out, it should enter the gingival sulcus and trace it right around the edge of each tooth. Move it from tooth to tooth so that you do not produce excessive amount of heat or temperature change on any one tooth. And you can move it back and forth between teeth. It's important to use a, enough prophylaxis paste so that the teeth are well covered at all times. The finger rests uh, which you use should be stable so that you're not using the handpiece uh, free-handed. When uh, polishing the labial aspects of the upper anterior teeth. I've many times seen people coming in here this way, which is uncomfortable. Anytime you're using the handpiece in an uncomfortable position, turn it around because uh, if it's uncomfortable, most likely there is a correct position that will enable you to work more comfortably. Upon completion of polishing of the buckles and linguals of the teeth, then one should take dental floss and use it in between the teeth to polish the proximal surfaces of the teeth. Many times, uh, if the contacts are close and tight, if there's a lot of prophylaxis paste in between the teeth, it will rip or shred or tear the floss. If this happens, it may be necessary to rinse the patient out slightly and then go back and floss interproximally. When you have finished the prophylaxis, it is then extremely important that you clean the prophylaxis contraangle because there's a fair amount of accumulated paste that gets down in the gear mechanism of the contraangle. Let me now demonstrate the methods to you for cleaning the contraangle. In order to prolong the life of the prophylaxis handpiece, it should be dissembled following each prophylaxis. Three tools are issued with each prophylaxis contraangle to aid you in dissembling the handpiece. One can be taken and used at this junction here and is inserted like this. Now I've loosened this up here, and now I can take and just unscrew this part of the handpiece. There is generally not much prophylaxis paste that accumulates in this gear here, but it should be dissembled at this joint and cleaned. Where the majority of the prophylaxis paste seems to accumulate is in the head of the contraangle. The head can be taken apart with the use of this wrench here and it is inserted in the head and turned to loosen the, the gear in the head. You then take and unscrew that and prophylaxis paste tends to work up in that joint. It's necessary to clean out the gears and the handpiece or the, the head of the handpiece and then take each of these three pieces this piece here this and this these three articles 
and send them into sterilization. In sterilization, they will take and run these through the ultrasonic cleaner. They are put in proclave emulsion to protect them from rust. Then they are returned to you in an autoclave bag. Carefully check the autoclave bag when it's returned from sterilization to see that all pieces of the handpiece are present. When you receive it back from sterilization, it will not run with just the proclave emulsion on it. It's necessary to take the grease which has been issued to you with the handpiece and place a small dab of grease on each one of the gears. Here and on here. Never leave a prophylaxis contraangle without grease on it because if it rests for a period of, of months or weeks without being used, rust will form in these gears and when you go to use it, uh, say in another month or so, you will have difficulty because it will be rusted shut. This uh, pretty well concludes the list of procedures and discussion of procedures to be used in the second clinic session. You've been listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu license.